Hello, and welcome to It's an Artful Life. I'm your host, Jillian Rhodes. This project started with a question. Do the arts matter anymore? I decided to start asking people that very question and came up with this project, an experiment on how and if people see and experience the arts in their daily lives. Is it an artful life? Let's find out. The interaction of politics and art is not one that many people think of or deal with. Indeed, in politics, generally arts are only discussed in order to cut the budget. But that connection might be a lot deeper than we think. Today, I talk with an incredible thinker whose work as a curator, speaker, and analyst has led him to deal with the connection of arts and politics all the time. Enjoy! Can you just briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, my name is Denis Maximov. I am uh, an independent curator, political theorist, and a researcher, and I'm based between Brussels, London, uh, and some other places, but mostly Brussels, I would say. I work with uh, several galleries uh, in uh, Brussels and in London as associate curator. I also curate a residency program in Brussels in uh, uh, Penthouse of the Hotel uh, in a pretty weird space, uh, which used to be a luxurious spot in the city uh, in the 80s and used to host American rock stars and presidents, but now turned into some sort of a decadent uh, mixed space of luxury and squat, uh, being blended in one, um, in one sort of um, weird combination. I also work in uh, independent projects, and uh, the main project that I develop is called Avenue Institute. It's a think tank that I co-founded together with a designer and a software developer um, and an artist, Timo Tuominen, who is Finnish, is also a member of Sandbox from the London Hub. Uh, and we founded it one year and a half ago as a project that meant to be a platform and a host for transdisciplinary research uniting the uh, um, paradigms of artistic research, of philosophy, politics, and technology in pursuit of um, exploration of, of potentialities in future studies. And uh, in the context of this project, we uh, commission exhibitions, we create installations, we create objects even. Uh, and uh, the, uh, as I told before, the, the question of authorship there is uh, strategically uh, blended uh, and strategically um, escaped through the answer of uh, the amount of people participating all the time in the Avenue Institute, because not again only two of us, there are also people who are on a permanent basis collaborating with us. Uh, and yeah, in this year, it's actually, the Institute is pretty young, it's just one year and a half, but we somehow managed to do a lot of things. Um, uh, in this in this period of time, the Institute was officially launched at the Venice Biennial uh, in uh, uh, 2015, in August, at the Creative Time Summit, where we were invited to uh, uh, make a lecture performance. Uh, and up from that moment on, uh, up to then, we we uh, uh, made exhibitions in uh, Berlin, in in uh, exhibitions lectures in Berlin, in London, uh, Venice, Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, Brazil, Sao Paulo. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, actually the show that is going to happen here and going to open in uh, two weeks is going to be a sort of a, a summary uh, of, of uh, not directly, of course, but sort of an overview of the research that we carried out in this period of time. Uh, and it's called Against the Future. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the total installation that is going to be presented there is called uh, a temple of a, for, for a temple uh, of futures thinking. On the other lines, basically of what I develop, I work also with uh, uh, other groups of curators and individually curators in different places. In uh, Rome and in Venice, I work with the curators of the Nationless Pavilion of the Venice Biennial, uh, and we already commissioned twice the pavilion during the Architecture Biennial and the Art Biennial in 2016 and 2015. I also work with a Brazilian curator called Caroline Carion, uh, and we have a curatorial duo with her, which is called um, Daniel Vazmozno. It's a very weird Russian expression, 
uh, that we uh, appropriated from the Russian everyday use and a bit twisted to uh, mean the superposition of total uncertainty, sort of, because it's a very weird expression. It's a very weird expression in Russian, which you can actually respond binary questions that normally presume the answer yes or no. But if you say Danet was Mozhna, that means basically yes, no, maybe, and none of them at the same time. So it's actually uh, that we call it the superposition of total uncertainty. Uh, and that sort of gave the title to our curatorial duo. And uh, we did a big project here, actually, in Sao Paulo during the Sao Paulo Biennial in September. We did a big group show uh, with 20 artists from Brazil and uh, from Europe, on the, which was called Bureau for Public Insecurities. And we created a fictional ministry uh, which was meant to cons consult the visitors about the subjects of uh, political and social inquiry that are not answered by the political and social institutions. For example, how do you get the same passports? Uh, how do you avoid uh, oppression uh, of uh, specific institutions that make you um, in our, as you know, in future studies, it's called post-normal time, is trying to make you normal again uh, by following the specific outlines and the specific institutional and hierarchical structures that they presume uh, to have as the, um, as the uh, 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 form of our reality. It's uh, amazing. Um, so, uh, do you consider yourself an artistic person? Oh, for sure, I think, but I think actually every person is an artistic person. It just depends on the social conditions and uh, depends on the way you you brought up, depends on how much money your parents have and how much, in what sort of uh, conditions you grow up, but I do really and sincerely believe that you can pick up the person from the street who is homeless and then cannot read and make out of him Damien Hurst if you want. Uh, I, I'm, I'm truly, I'm truly open in, in the in the line of actually seeing potential almost in any person. We are unfortunately very much squeezed by the very society we're living in. Mm. So uh, I think I think I heard you say before that you had just really kind of gotten into art about five years ago. Uh, I would say that, that the into art history I got into and into poetry I got into much earlier, but uh, just in conditions of my growing up, let's say in Russia. And also my professional training in there, there was basically, I had, did not really have any time, neither institutional possibility to uh, engage with contemporary art or with what is actually called contemporary art. Back then, when I lived in Moscow in 2007, 2008, it was just a couple of places where you could uh, somehow engage with the subject, but uh, that was very rudimentary even back then. And just when I moved to Belgium, I basically, from the open door, went to the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp and asked, so, so what can I do here? And uh, it's not very common to be a very initiative in there. So I sort of uh, pushed my way in, in the first place. And then, <laughs> and, then I, and then after some time in the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, I also then did the uh, uh, pre-PhD program in uh, St. Lucas on philosophy, critical theory, and uh, research of art and design. So that sort of was the, uh, the line of uh, building up the knowledge that I also uh, was accumulating before, because uh, I was very much engaged with the history of art before, through political history actually, through very much of the political history, because I also uh, genuinely see them very much intertwined. Uh, Interesting. And very much reflecting each other, yeah. So um, is that the kind of the political history, is that kind of what drove you to the arts? Like how did you get really interested in, in participating in the arts? I would say my, my fundamental reason would be that I really do find that politics and art have much more in common that maybe is, is commonly perceived because they both mm -hmm. deal, I think this, both of these activities, art and politics, artistic activity and political activity, I find them um, the most human activities, actually, that define us as, as, the, as the beings as we are and define our difference, actually, with the animal world. Because we, we have the two drives that are uh, present of, in some way or another in the, in the um, animal world, but in, in the uh, sense of our humanity, those drives are very much uh, maximized. So it's the drive to power, drive to political power and desire to govern, and the drive to, um, to uh, 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 aesthetic thought or drive to beauty, whatever you could call it, basically. Drive, drive to pleasure, to visual pleasure. And those two drives, they are, uh, from my perspective, are very much 
um, illogical uh, in their in, in the very core of them because drive to power if it's authentic drive to power. Uh, and this is actually a very big misconception also in thinking about politics that, that, you know, the good politician just wants to get a lot of resources and actually the, uh, the purpose of any politician in politics is to uh, make sure that you grab as much, I don't know, money as you can. This is total misconception because the actual purpose of the good politician, the good politician, it may be a horrible politician like Hitler, I mean, but, but Hitler was a good politician in that sense because the, the purpose of the, of the politician, of the authentic politician is political power. Political power that actually not convertible into. It's of course it could be on the it could on the way also bring you a lot of other resources, material, immaterial, and so on. But the power itself is very authentic resource. And the same is the same resources that maybe you could call it aura, you know, aura in art. If to follow follow Walter Benjamin, it's this ephemeral uh, ephemeral sort of drive to to grasp something that you cannot understand because both aura in art. And power in politics, they're not really materializable. You cannot really, you know, imagine yourself in your head, uh, the image of power or the image of aura. It's really something that you can only feel, uh, through either you are having it or you have an impression you're having it, or impression you're perceiving it and you're reading it. And I do find that those both, um, feelings in a way and those both, um, uh, energies of the, of our activity are, are defining our authenticity. Okay, nice. Um, do you have a, a particularly memorable experience of art? No, uh, sure, many, uh, quite many, actually. Uh, and again, the experience of art is not experience of something as it's shown to you as art or is demonstrated to you as art. Uh, uh, this is, and this is also a very uh, interesting point of the liberation of the artistic field in this way in the 20th century, 19th century that. Uh, you can actually find art whenever you uh, whenever you go because it's art is a strategy in so many instances as well. It's a strategy of escape from the uh, st sort of surmountable and you know in a very much uh, uh, over hierarchy hierarchized structures of our contemporary living. So um, out of the very classic ones, I would say that one of the most memorable things. Two there are two memorable paintings that I that I. Um, uh, every time coming back to in my mind, it's uh, the uh, uh, the Garden of Early Delights of Euronymous Bosch, which I saw first time in Prado in Madrid. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, long ago, maybe ten years ago, or, or and uh, it was the painting in which in front of which I was standing for I don't know an hour maybe uh, not living, and that that was the end. Since then, Bosch uh, basically, I, I like the I love the Bosch in general, uh, but but the, this particular painting is uh, is uh, uh, really grasps this 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 essence of aura that I'm talking about in in in, in my view. Uh, the other there are many other instances like that uh, of particular sparks in uh, in uh, careers of the artists. For example, Guernica of Picasso is also an incredibly powerful painting to stand in front of and to see it actually live. Um, so I'm very much in that sense actually agreeing with the uh, Walter Benjamin uh, understanding of of authenticity of artistic object and the the power of the artistic object and what it could actually mean. And this multiplicity of meanings it could convey, because the again experience of art in that sense is uh, mentioning and noticing somewhere in some object that might not be even appropriated and presented to you as an art object, noticing there that it's that sort of black hole and vortex that could bring you into the, the into the uh, portal that you can enter, you know, multiverse through that, and you can you can totally twist the. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the anthropological gravity of what we sort of um, seeing as our limitation to again to um, uh, to see that the knowledge is quite infinite thing and it has so many uh, different colors and different shades and uh, I find that art is very very important in society exactly for that uh, exactly for that reasons among many other. Okay, um, you just you're talking about like art as a as a strategy. Um, do you think that you experience art on a daily basis? You know, not 
in a museum, but you know, getting up and going to work or or on no, the of weekends course, or of course, I think kind of I, I think actually everybody does. I think everybody does, but not maybe everybody reflects on that. But I do believe that everybody does because it's again, it's the you experience power on a daily basis. You experience art as well on a very daily basis because if you don't, you're a monkey, you're a chimpanzee, or uh, <laughs> because it's it's this is exactly what makes you human. People might deny it basically that or might not notice it. They might not take it as experience of arts. But you know, when even the most, uh, the, you know, the, the most bankery, whatever, executive and accountant who does not believe and don't like art and never go to museums, even that person, I don't know, uh, chooses specific laptops, uh, chooses specific products on the basis of sometimes the uh, um, uh, argumentation that might not be even artic articulated in the head uh, in words, but it's articulated on, on the basis of the visual thinking and the basis of the um, uh, absorption of the visual information around yourself and those decisions that we make on an everyday basis uh, and those decisions are concerning not only aesthetic decisions, they're also moral decisions, ethical decisions, political decisions and so on, they are very much influenced by how we are seeing the world and what we are seeing as beautiful or or containing this sort of um, energy that, that conveys that, that if we w go into that direction, we are actually following the path of being who we are. Yeah. So, um, okay. So what do you think is the greatest gift, shall we say, that art gives to the world? So kind of, uh, you know, you've talked about art as kind of one of the fundamental things that, that make us human. Um, you know, so a world without art is basically one in which we're all chimpanzees. But what do you think the kind of the most important thing that art gives us and gives our lives? It gives a lot of things, I think. There is no one specific. That's actually, I think, the most interesting part of art because it's one of the most multiplicit uh, also um, areas of human activity as well because you can get from art anything you want, uh, starting from the education, expertise, uh, thinking, research, going to inspiration, uh, calm, I don't know, calmness, uh, peace, uh, Actually, it's it's so much, but also art might also create wars. Art might create, you know, it's 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 uh, art in this sense is a little bit like uh, the ancient Greek god the Zanake. You know, it's I don't know if you uh, you know know a bit the Greek mythology, but the, there is this uh, funny goddess in a in a Greek pantheon called Ananke that is a goddess of uh, the the, be the the most uh, incredible beauty and at the same time the most uh, incredible horrors. So it's sort of the uh, the plank that is very much. Uh, variable uh, from uh, in the infinite alphabet that you can actually take it from to because art can inspire to do horrific things basically incredibly horrific things because uh, I don't know um, uh, uh, fascistic regimes for example are in a way are pieces of art in a way it's it's the way to to make statehood an art object in a way propaganda and ideology uh, good ideology actually has to be a piece of art because you have to inspire people to do things they would not logically do and there exactly and a good example when art becomes a strategy to uh, to uh, and I don't say it in a neither negative or positive thing I just say it in the point of the neutral analysis of how do you look at it at the same time you know art inspires to do the most beautiful things in the world the uh, you know the most gentle the most calm the, the most kind the uh, uh, art conveys messages that that makes us completely rethink uh, the everyday activity we're doing. You know, if you look at uh, if you look at I don't know the uh, examples, for example, of Marta Rosler performances with uh, an, on the kitchen in the 60s that that conveyed the beginning of feminism and and the reinterpretation of everyday life. Uh, and politicizing everyday life into the level of subpolitics. I mean, this is just uh, so hard to, uh, it's so hard to overestimate the importance of what happened in there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's as multiplicit basically as life. It has no color as nature, basically. You know, nature could be incredibly terrifying and incredibly beautiful. I mean, nature could kill us tomorrow. Nature could give us, you know, mangoes uh, and papayas. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> art is very much the same. It's, it's really, uh, Talented people in that sense, and art, art is not a very art is as a nature. You know, art is not a cute thing. It can can be cute, but it could be quite horrific if it's if it's also strategically well done to be horrific in a sense of the consequences. Right. 
It's really, yeah, that's, it's interesting. Um, so you were talking before about, you know, how people, everybody experiences art on a daily basis, but they don't necessarily experience it. They don't necessarily... No, they don't necessarily it. reflect on it, yeah. It's a, reflect on it, yeah. I see. It's like, when, you know, everybody breathes, breathes, for example, but we don't really reflect on that, that we actually breathe. So it's a bit, it is a bit like that, like with arts, I think. It's a, you can suddenly stop and, you know, and take a deep breath. It's a little bit like meditation that you could do, but it's not that everybody does it. It's a, most people just breathe, and uh, and they, they breathe this art in, and uh, and uh, for them it's part of everyday experience that that somehow natural, but it's actually experience of art. Do you think that um, people would benefit from reflecting on it more? I certainly do think that that would be the case. Again, you know, like taking the example of some meditation or breathing techniques, for example. You know, if we would breathe better on everyday basis, and if we would do exercises in breathing, you know, we would be much more calm and we would uh, probably, uh, not that we need to decelerate. I'm not one of these people, you know, who is uh, saying that we need to stop blood problems and, and so on. But uh, it's, 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 it's just being more aware, actually, of your environment. Be, being more aware and knowing more what influences your everyday life, your everyday experiences, makes you more uh, resilient, makes you more prepared, makes you more um, also flexible and twistable to the uh, environment that you're living in. Because, again, we're living in a very hostile environment. We're hostile towards each other. We're hostile the, the, the uh, nature hostile to us. Uh, you know, everything is hostile to you. You are surviving, basically. The life is survival, whatever you say about that. So in this constant struggle for survival, basically, art is one of those one of those very important components that allow allow us to increase the level of life into that struggle for survival. Art is sort of the uh, the ambrosia of life in that sense. And in case people would reflect on that more, I think they would be happier. They would be more open. They would be more um, multiplicit in thinking and not thinking in particular lines. And uh, for example, in the contemporary political environment now, we definitely need more art. Uh, and uh, that's a, that's a, and we need actually we almost need art terrorism. I just had a very great actually conversation about it <laughs> yesterday. It's like you know if Jeff Koons tomorrow would just would just uh, uh, come out uh, you know on the uh, to to a call press conference and and tell something like you know guys all the stuff that I did for since 1982 1981 it's actually total bullshit i never believed in it i just you know wanted to make money and i wanted to actually prove that you all guys will buy into that so actually all that crap that you invested into millions of dollars worth nothing basically even though if he would do that i would be his biggest fan and he would be the, the second marcel duchamp but whether he'll do it or not you know it will be really if he will do it it would be terroristic act you know because he would drop the prices in contemporary art markets you know uh, completely to the to, to the ground so most of the most of the sort of celebrity art in that sense that craps a lot of because you know as also what is really important in understanding from my perspective in art is that it's not that we have good art and bad art i don't believe in good art or bad art we have either arts and non arts it's it's uh, because the the Again, like, you know, in this example of the negative and horrific art in the sense, this negative and horrific art is also art. You cannot, you cannot like it, you cannot agree with it, but it's art still at the, the moment. Mm. It's still something to study. It's still something to learn from, actually. Not learning maybe what it wanted to achieve and what it was standing for, but learning how it looked, learning how it actually, you know, achieved the level where it went to and so on. And if we will do that, I think we will much more we will be much more conscious about ourselves. Hmm. So the, this is the, this is the, actually the last question of, um, that I have. And that's, uh, just quite simply, what do you think it means to live an artful life? Uh, well, I think it means to live a life actually just to live a life because the, the, the life, the non artful life is, a, I think it's existence. It's a, in a way, because, you know, love, love in that sense and, you know, all, all the emotional, um, sort of conversions into what, what everybody sort of craves for it wants to. It's also very much an artistic expression of ourselves. It's because art is, uh, in a way responsible for everything illogical, for everything uh, that has no particular functional purpose. Art is something that actually um, 
guarantees, I think, if we will be able to preserve it and we'll be able to understand that, that no non-artificial intelligence will ever, uh, uh, I, I would not say will ever, ever, maybe, uh, to, <laughs> to replace the, the hum, human experience. But up to until now, I would say mechanization of human experience and specific um you know, functionalization of specific things that we live now in, 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 through would not replace that experience of arts in, in a way, because you can teach the robot to, to uh, follow specific patterns and even be creative in some specific way. And, uh, you know, even be creative in the sense of creating algorithm behind of what you do. But uh, you would, I, I really, I really still don't see how you can replicate this mystery of the human brain, because, you know, we still know about human brain much less than we know about the universe. Uh, so many things happen in there and so many things happen in a sense of this instant because neuron connections are faster than speed of light and uh, we still have so much to learn about it. So, uh, and art, I think, is a very, very, very instrumental for that learning. With arts, we, I don't think we, it will be possible to achieve understanding of, um, um, uh, of who we are and, and why we are as we are and, uh, why we're so fucked up in so many senses and so on, uh, without actually looking into the artistic experience and looking into why we're craving for things uh, and why actually we find those things, the most human things and the most authentic things that might happen to us in, our, in the course of our life. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much for the very thoughtful answers. Cool. Thank you so much. Sweet. It's an Artful Life will return next week with another interview. Thanks for listening.